Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of Perspectives. I am your host, Sharon Pearson, and we are joined today by an extraordinary guest who has done some remarkable work in a field that is maybe to some of us a little left of centre. Her name is Tanya Dijong, and she is the founder and executive director of Mind Medicine Australia. And she has done some phenomenal work in moving forward, ensuring that some psychedelics and MDMA becomes legalized within Australia for therapeutic purposes. This is a topic that I find truly fascinating. Tanya is the executive director and co-founder and board director of Mind Medicine Australia. And it is a registered charity acting as a central node for regulatory approved and research backed psychedelics. She is identified in the Psychedelic Invest Top 100 Influential People in Psychedelics. And she became interested in the resurgence in psychedelic research field after searching for ways to manage her own mental health and her own well being. And we talk about this in the episode. She explains and walks us through her first psychedelic experience and how it transformed her. With the support of her partner, Peter, she set out on a quest to have a therapeutic experience, but being able to do this in a safe and legal setting, which, as you probably know around the world, isn't that easy to accomplish. After experiencing this life-changing experience, she realized the potential of these medicines, and she very clearly and distinctly calls them a medicines not an illegal substance. And she also makes it clear here that MDMA and the psychedelics we talk about are not addictive, despite what we may have heard and the moral panic that can be attached to conversations like this. So she's on a mission to help alleviate the suffering caused by mental illness in Australia that she truly believes is not necessary. And when you hear us have this conversation and you hear about the stats and what's been achieved in clinical trials around the world right now, there are over 100 clinical trials taking place around the world, including at John Hopkins, one of the most renowned research facilities in the world. And when you hear these results, and we'll include in the show notes links for you to get more information and maybe to some research as well, so you can see for yourself how profound an impact that these medicines combined with therapy can have on people who are suffering from PTSD, depression, anxiety, even eating disorders. It is mind-blowing what I've been learning. She also, as part of my Medicine Australia, helps to and has phenomenal facilitators helping to train the facilitators of tomorrow, the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the therapists who will, when this becomes legislated within Australia, guide people who want to experience a transformation from their depression or their anxiety or their PTSD. And the team is training them an entire process of how you can go through this therapeutic process. This is not an advocacy program for taking drugs illegally. It is not an advocacy program for going to a rave, getting smashed, not drinking water and becoming a statistic. This is a conversation based on current research in 2021. And it is really exciting what the future holds. It's so great that you're joining us today, Tanya. Thank you so much. I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about your journey as to how you got here to having that as your backdrop, Mind Medicine Australia, if you would please. Sure. Look, uh, that's a really long story. And take the whole <laughs> but um, I mean, to cut a long story short, um, well, my drug of choice has always been singing. Um, so I have always loved singing and it's been a wonderful form of meditation, relaxation, therapy, entertainment, um, connection, so many things for me. And so I've never felt the need to have any drugs of any kind. And I've never, in fact, I've always been quite anti-drugs. And uh, so it is, it is surprising that I do have this as my backdrop. But I guess to cut a long story short, you know, I'm the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Uh, my grandmother invented the foldable umbrella in Vienna in 1929. Um, so, you know, innovation is very much in my blood. And I have founded two previous charities to Mind Medicine Australia, plus about six other creative businesses as well. And... Um, I've been a performer um, for, you know, all of all of my sort of adult life, 
even though I was told never to bother having singing lessons at the age of 14. And But I also did a law degree and I've always been extremely entrepreneurial. And so, you know, I sort of, I guess, become this serial entrepreneur. And as I've evolved and grown, um, I become interested in different things. And there's just sort of been this, um, yeah, I mean, this evolution to where I am today, where I'm, you know, a co-founder and executive director of Mind Medicine Australia. And though still, um, you know, very passionate about my work as, both a performer, singer and speaker and some of the work that I do for collective healing, um, a lot of the event production work I do as well is tied into all of this. So in a sense, it's bringing together a whole lot of different things that I do. Um, But Mind Medicine Australia is is certainly all-consuming, like it's taking a lot Mm. of time Mm. uh, up for me and my husband. We do this pro bono. And we also do Why? That's the question. <laughs> I get that you do all these other things, but why that is the backdrop? That's what I'm interested yeah. in. How did you arrive at a place where make, getting, helping and facilitating the movement for psychedelics to become mm-hmm. legal for medicinal purpose? How did that happen? Yeah, so that really happened because I've always been interested in hacking myself. So, you know, I've, I've tried lots and lots of different things, different diets, you know, tantra, mantra, cryotherapy, uh, myotherapy, <laughs> I think all the things that rhyme, you know, hyperbaric oxygen, um, all sorts of different retreats, relationship work, um, personal development and physical sort of um, stamina sort of modalities that I've always been really interested in. And I never heard about psychedelic assisted therapies until about five and a half years ago when I read a blog of Tim Ferriss, who's one of the great Mm -hmm. donors and investors in this field. And he announced that he was donating a hundred thousand US dollars to Imperial College for trials uh, of psilocybin assisted therapy to treat depression. And I don't suffer from depression myself, but I certainly know a lot of people who are suffering with depression, have worked with a lot of people who are suffering with depression. And so I clicked on the link and was to an article by Michael Pollan in the New Yorker magazine called The Trip Treatment. Mm. And yeah, I read this article and it was about, in fact, um, profiling a Jewish man who was going through an end of life trial. He had a terminal diagnosis, but he had been experiencing, I think, some transgenerational trauma and Mm. I had also been experiencing that I didn't really know what it was you know I'd have some strange dreams from time to time where maybe I was and this was awful you know where I was standing in front of a Nazi firing squad and and things like that and I'm, I'm thinking well where is this coming from you know this is I wasn't there for that and so I felt that there was you know, parts of my psyche, I guess, that were still carrying some of this ancestral trauma. And so when I read, you know, about this guy's sort of remission from mm. conditions and things, I thought, oh, this sounds amazing, you know, like amazing. And so I, I said to my husband, read this article. I think we should do, do this treatment. He read it and he said, oh, you know, it sounds interesting, but he didn't take any more interest in it. But he said, oh, if you want to organise it, just go ahead. And he generally does say that about a lot of things. Um, and so I then reached out to Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, who's one of the leading researchers in this field, who was mentioned in the article and mm. asked him if there were any healthy patients trials that we could participate in because we don't have a, a mental illness diagnosis, but there weren't any taking place in, the, in, in Europe at the time. And so we were eventually referred to a guide in the Netherlands and mm. we then flew to the Netherlands where we, worked with that guide um, and had a massive medicinal dose of psilocybin, pure psilocybin, which was preceded by Syrian rue, which is a MAOI inhibitor. So the protocol was called psilocybin, which was a combination really of psilocybin and some of the effect of ayahuasca because of the MAOI inhibitor of Syrian rue. And this was such 
a huge experience. Like we were literally mm. shot out of our bodies into other yeah. dimensions, into the multiverse. Um, these <laughs> exceptional journeys, that, this journey that we went on, um, and of course our journeys were entirely different. Peter's mm. father had committed suicide when he was 13 or so. So, wow. you know, we all carry trauma either directly mm. or indirectly. I think we're all carrying a lot of angst and yeah. grief um, along mm. with us. And particularly now I've never felt so much that we're carrying as a, as a mm. collective. And disconnection. And huge disconnection. Yeah. And, you know, the wonderful thing about these medicines is the enormous sense of connectivity that they bring exactly. about. You know, yeah. this sense of being connected to yourself, to others, to the planet. It really mm. is very profound. And the healing mm. that we experienced was enormous. Um, and it's not that we were really ill or that we were not mm. functioning or anything like that, but we became much better functioning. Uh, mm. You know, I thought I was creative before, but, <laughs> was, <laughs> but, you know, like I've been able to join the dots and understand mm. things that I previously was not able to understand as well. Um yeah, it's it's really a profound effect, um, and it's improved our relationship enormously. Our relationships with our families, our, our colleagues. Um, mm. I think we've become, you know, more grounded, um, more authentic. Uh, mm. There's less ego in the way because I experienced, and we both experienced, like complete ego dissolution. So for me, what that was like was. Um, when I'd taken the medicine and I deliberately call these medicines because that's what they are. These are ancient medicines. You know, they've been with humans mm. since the beginning of civilization. Yeah. And you can see the history of these medicines in ancient Greek and Roman cultures in the archaeology. You can see the mushrooms and things like that. Ancient drinks like kaikion that were taken to alter people uh, states to, to take them into these these yeah. non ordinary states and they've been in indigenous cultures uh since you know the very beginning and they still are of course being used in indigenous cultures completely legally in mexico south america i mean these medicines are legal in the netherlands and you know a range of other places it just seems so ridiculous to me that you know you can go out into your garden or a field and there's all these psilocybin mushrooms which contain you know, mm. psilocin, yeah. which is the mind-altering substance, and yet if you eat that mushroom, if you pick it and eat that mushroom, then that's, you know, it could end up with you being prosecuted and, you know, put in jail or whatever. It's completely ridiculous mm. when you can actually mm. go into your garden and pick a poisonous mushroom and eat it and die, whereas you could mm. eat these mushrooms and completely be healed of many of, you know, the things that you're struggling with and suffering with in this human carnation that we're that we're in so yeah. um yeah it was it was a extremely profound experience um we came out of it saying that not only was it incredible for us but that we've set up four charities between us before mind medicine australia and both of us just said well you know you can provide housing you know, my husband's the founder of Women's Community Shoulders. I'm the founder of the Song Room and Creativity Australia and the With One Voice program to provide creative programs, wonderful social inclusion choirs. You know, you can provide all these things to people who are suffering disadvantage of some kind or another, whether it's homelessness, unemployment, disability, whatever mm. it happens to be, you know, feeling older and more isolated. But the fact is if a person has a mental illness, of some kind there there's some sense of angst depression whatever it happens to be trauma that they're carrying along with them if you cannot get to the root of that trauma it doesn't matter what else you give them because actually they're not going to to feel better and they're not going to be able to lead a fully meaningful and contributing life and imagine if that's a gift that we can give to people that they can feel mm. you know connected and and more whole, more of themselves. If that's a gift we can give people, then we should give that to people and we shouldn't withhold it from 
particularly mm. from people who are suffering. But, of course, we shouldn't withhold it from anyone because it's our birthright. These plants are on this planet for a reason. Um, they are a medicine. They contribute to our well-being, our sense of wholeness, oneness, our unity with, you know, self and others. I mean, how could we deny people the experience of travelling into altered dimensions and experiencing the 95% of life that we actually don't see on a daily basis. Mm. We started really after that first experience, you know, meeting a lot of the researchers, reading mm. a lot of the, the trials that were going on and familiarising ourselves with the space. Then we started going to conferences and events around the world. A year later, we did another ceremony experience I guess with the same guide and it was even more profound and then mm -hmm. we were just completely convinced we were just like well everyone needs to have access to these medicines who who needs access to them mm -hmm. and we also looked at what was not going on in Australia really there was very little going on in Australia yeah. there were you know an amateur psychedelic society and and that sort of thing. But there was, you know, a tiny handful of researchers who were interested in the space, but there was really nothing. We had nothing to it. offer. We were acting yeah. in Australia like it was 1970 and Nixon had just declared war on drugs. <laughs> well, that's Our right. thinking that's in Australia for years. so long, yeah, it's out of date by 50 years. So, right. and now yeah. there is research in Australia because the thinking around this is come full circle. So thank that's you. Right. I'd love to just add a little disclaimer here, add a little caveat for anyone listening who perhaps is still perhaps thinking the way I used to think, Tanya. <laughs> so this is for anybody who's thinking like I used to think. This is not us advocating taking any drug however you want. We are not advocating the use of drugs that you buy off the street. We're not suggesting that we be irresponsible with it. What we're having a conversation about is using psychedelics, something like perhaps MDMA, which is a different category of therapeutic medicine or a psychedelic like psilocybin for therapeutic purposes to help in the healing process, ideally with a trained therapist who's trained in how to guide you through a really extensive process. Because I've now watched the uh, movie you, you had on that around the Israel study that was done. Yeah. And I'm familiar with a number of the protocols now on how to help someone resolve trauma and the kind of stats these results are producing. So I invite you, if you're an audience member thinking, I never want my kids to do drugs. We are not advocating your kids to do drugs. I mean, I think it's important also to say to, to everyone who, you know, watches, listens to this, is that everything is about the context. Mm. Um, everything is about the context in which a medicine or drug is used. Yeah. So, you know, morphine, which is used um, often in the hospital, but, you know, if you take it recreational, it's, it's no good. Heroin on the street is no good, but it's used in anaesthetics when you go and have an operation mm. in hospital. So everything is about your intention and mm. how you use that medicine in an intentional way for healing or whether you're using it just to get off your face because you can't deal with your trauma. Yeah, It's leading you to become an addict, an addict in something else. It's important, though, to say that these medicines are extremely safe and non-addictive, even in recreational yeah. environments. Yeah. They considered two MDMA, particularly, and, and psilocybin in their pure GMP grade form are considered extremely safe in recreational environments, whereas alcohol is by mm -hmm. far the most dangerous drug to self and others. And that's been proven in multiple trials and studies around the world. So. We are talking about medicines that when used intentionally um, under the guidance of, you know, a supervised guide or therapist can truly transform um, your perspective on life and certainly create mm. enormous healing for a range of conditions, not only including depression and anxiety and trauma, but are now being trialled for addiction and the, the results for treating addiction the results. are enormous. Enormous, incredible yeah. um, end of life anxiety obsessive compulsive yeah. disorder anorexia and eating disorders alzheimer's another PTSD. Dementia, parkinson's cluster headaches and of course ptsd yeah. and so we're seeing these medicines now being trialed for like 
an enormous variety of conditions. And my belief is that they will be trialed for even a, a broader group of conditions as time goes on, um, because the way that they reconnect um, our brains, our neural pathways is so significant that that and, and that sense of connectivity is so important to a person's healing. And really these medicines help to empower us to become agents for our own healing rather than taking daily pills or mm. relying on a psychotherapist for the rest of our lives. And this is nothing against the wonderful psychotherapists no. that are out there. It's simply saying that there are treatments and with two to three medicinal treatments combined with a short course of psychotherapy, 60 to 80% of patients across 160 recent trials are going to remission. Now you compare that against 30 to 35% remission rates from current treatments for depression or just 5% remission rates for post-traumatic stress disorder. From and it comes illness. back. And if they suspend right. treatment, it returns. Yeah, yes. and let alone all the side effects and the withdrawal mm. outcomes that, yeah. that occur through these medications and so on. So mm. in this case, we're saying that mental illness does not have to be a life sentence, that there is a cure for many mm. patients available, not for all. This is not a panacea for all. And nor are we saying that current existing treatments don't work for some patients. They do. They just don't work for the majority of patients. And we have a mental health crisis. And this is one of the reasons why Peter and I, as philanthropists and social entrepreneurs, are putting all our money and time, energy into this because the impact is enormous. The potential impact is huge. Like mm. Mind Medicine Australia and other organisations like it have the potential to change and save the lives of millions of people yeah. who are suffering. There's one million health. soldiers in the US struggling with PTSD as we speak and traditional old school therapies are not resolving it, but the results they're having five years later, 53 to 50%, 7% of them have cannot any longer be classed as having PTSD. Yeah, in the recent phase three trial of MAPS with both yeah. veterans, first responders and also others suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder, straight after just three medicinal doses of MDMA with a short course of psychotherapy, 67% of those patients have gone into remission. And it's expected that as they integrate the experience further, yeah. and it's important to say psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy means the medicine, the psychedelic with the psychotherapy, the medicine on its own is not going to be fully effective for anyone out there. I just say that as a word of caution yeah. to everyone. You need yeah. to do this with a proper integration process because the insights that you will experience using these medicines are profound, but to capture them and bring them into your lives, your relationship, relationships, your work, whatever you need to bring them into mm. all elements of your life takes integration it takes work with a therapist to bring those learnings mm. in and to then make the changes that you need to make in your life that are going to relieve some of the suffering and and help you to experience what is really here this beautiful life that mm. we've been gifted by our parents it's just yeah. such a gift and it's, yeah. it's a terrible tragedy that most people can't experience that gift that you know and this is really really the reason why we set up Mind Medicine Australia is because we have this mental health epidemic in Australia and globally that is, is just getting worse and worse. You know, pre-COVID in Australia alone, we had one in five Australians with a mental illness, one in eight being prescribed antidepressants, but one in four older adults and one in 30 children as young as four. Now, that is a terrible indictment. You know, we are over-prescribing these medications more than just about any other OECD patient. And furthermore, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, these statistics suggest that one in two of us will suffer a mental illness in our lifetimes. And we can't continue to over-medicate people in the way that is occurring at the moment. Well, the medication is suppressing a symptom, whereas the... Therapies that are now in, in studies around the world, a lot of studies in the world, are dealing with the core of it and resolving the core issues. So the symptoms will are no longer required. There's one story I heard about, and I, I think I'm going to attribute it to Rick Doblin, 
who is one of the major leaders in the world in this research. I know you have a relationship with him. I think it was him. I'll give him credit for it. My apologies if it isn't him, whoever that is. And he said one of the first experiences of it was a soldier who experienced PTSD and had for years, 17 years, I think it was. And he held on to the PTSD. He realized this when he was taken through the therapeutic process. And on his very first trip, I think it was MDMA, but I can't remember if it was still a t- cyber. He came to realize that he was staying in stress to honor his dead comrades. I'm going to get emotional. Mm. And only in that very first trip, you mean the requirement is you have therapy, then you have a trip, some therapy trip, therapy trip, some therapy at the end. So it's three trips with therapy back to back. Mm-hmm. He did the pre-therapy, did this one trip and realized the only reason he held on to was honor his dead comrades. As a result of the psilocybin, he became his dead comrades and saw his life through their eyes. And in the moment of seeing his life through their eyes, he realized they'd never want that for him. Mm. He dropped out of that very first study. And years later, any symptoms of PTSD are completely Mm. resolved. And now he works assisting people experiencing trauma. And that's just to correct you, by the way, I think that person Please. who is MDMA therapy, not psilocybin. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank no, you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> MDMA assisted therapy is the one that's used for post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. And addiction. Yeah. The psilocybin therapy is used for depression, end of life Perfect. and addiction as well. So. Perfect. But, uh, and they were able to drop out of the study and say, I don't need the rest of the trips. I don't need right. the therapy. And they've had years of therapy. And putting aside whatever issues we have around this, let's pause and take in this, what looks like in any other category, if it wasn't criminalized, we would consider miraculous and worth pursuing with all our might. The world would be transformed if it was doing this for anything else that had a legal substance around it. Totally. That is a transformation. Their life is changed and saved because of this. Let's pause and think, well, maybe we need to change our views of it, our preconceptions that come from the 1970s, or late 60s, and realize what's shifted in the world now, which I love. I love the shift that's now occurring. Well, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, if you think about it, the, the existing treatments, most of them are based on science that is over 50 years old. Yes. I mean, in what other field of medicine are we so stuck in the past? And why aren't we running towards these treatments? You know, so the Brigadier General of the um, Veterans in in the US said, you know, Mm -hmm. based on the data and facts, we should be running towards these treatments. Yeah. You know, if this could even save a handful of lives, but it can save literally millions Mm -hmm. of lives. So why aren't we doing that? Well, I think it's turning now. So let's just take a moment and talk. It was really bad in the 60s. So uh, one of the lines I think Rick said, but again, I think I'm giving you a bit too much credit. I think it was Griffiths said in the 1960s, it was used in a lot of clinical trials back then, as you know, Tanya, it Mm. escaped over the laboratory wall and made it out into the counterculture. And the counterculture getting hold of it meant that the all the negative stories and the myths began to be produced around the world. That's how we heard these stories about if you took it, you would stare at the sun until you went blind. Yeah. It was a complete myth and a lie that was created to create fear amongst it, which forced it way underground for way too long. Okay. But we're talking today because that landscape is no longer the landscape we find no, ourselves absolutely. in. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. So even though I didn't know what psilocybin was and I didn't even really know what psychedelics were, to be honest, yeah. Um, when I did this, there was still obviously some of those messages, that stigma was flying yes. around because I wasn't yeah. even aware that I had it. But I was like, am I going to go crazy? Am I going to have a heart yeah. attack? Is, you know, so these, you know, this sort of, the, these myths are very strong. And so one of the really important roles of Mind Medicine Australia is to actually dispel those myths and to focus on the science and the data. Because when we focus on the science and data, it's absolutely clear. Like, you know, the risks um, attached to these medicines are actually extremely low. There has not been a single adverse event with thousands of patients who've undergone either psilocybin or MDMA-assisted therapy across over 160 trials. You know, no one has become a drug addict before because of them. In fact, many drug addicts and smoking um, addict, addicts, uh, smokers, have, have actually been able to like their addictions have gone because of these treatments. So yeah. it's, it's really um, 
yeah, it's amazing how we we sort of turned things upside down, didn't we? You know, so that mm, yeah. alcohol was not made criminal, cigarettes were not made criminal, mm. you know, and cocaine and methamphetamines and all these really dangerous drugs, you know, that people can access very easily. And yet, yeah. But, yes, what is really great is <laughs> we're seeing this renaissance now. and We are. Its brand has been rejuvenated, Tanya. Right. So leading the way, just so we can get some facts out there for people listening who've never heard about this renaissance that's been going on, John yeah. Hopkins has been conducting studies for a while now. NYU is conducting studies. Studies have now begun in Australia. There's millions of dollars of funding. It's not a lot, but some. But one of the stories I found most interesting was Tim Ferriss was talking last year in 2020 as a result of a citizen philanthropy. They raised $30 million in private funds to pursue clinical trials, stage three trials in the effectiveness of psychedelics in therapeutic settings. That tells me the tide has turned on this conversation finally to enable people who need the help, who are suitable for these types of therapies can get the help. And just to be very conservative, there is complete recognition not everybody is suited to this. There are some personality types and some, I think it's, Remind me, what is it not suited for? So well, at the moment, so at the moment, schizophrenia and bipolar are excluded yes. from those with incidents of, of psychosis. But many of the psychiatrists actually believe that over time, as you know, these medicines are studied further, those conditions mm. will also be able to be treated. And I yeah. do know of instances of people who have been so because they haven't been accepted into the trials because of those conditions, they've gone underground with either mm. borderline or bipolar and other conditions and have actually healed as well yeah Um, yeah. but at the moment they're excluded from the trials and you know time it will just take time and the more that we invest in um you know research in this space but also the more that actual access is granted so that we can collect data as people go through treatments and that's one of the things we've really fast-tracked in australia Mm. is that these treatments are currently available through special access scheme pathways and um, what that means is that a doctor or psychiatrist you know can work with a treatment resistant patient so a patient who's tried two or more other treatments that haven't worked and who is very ill and potentially could be suicidal but certainly is very ill and the doctor and psychiatrist applies to the TGAR regulator to treat that patient with either psilocybin or MDMA assisted therapy And the TGA has been granting those treatments. Uh, In fact, I don't believe they've knocked any back since last June. So that's a federal approval. But then the doctor then needs to get an approval in the state to treat the patient. And in some states, there are still these recreational use laws that prevent the medicines from being brought in because they're seen as drugs instead of medicines. So what we need to make sure occurs Mm. is that there's a national standardisation a permit system put in place in every state of Australia that means Mm. that doctors can bring those medicines in to treat patients in clinical environments. That's completely different to a recreational use setting. So, you know, again, this comes down to context. And unfortunately, the states are not making the distinction between the use of the medicine in a medical environment to treat a patient who's really unwell and potentially save their life versus, you know, someone who's going mm. underground to access, you know, these drugs. And what's the illegal? resistance around it, given it's moved so far forward in the United States? So in the United States, the FDA has uh, last year declared it for breakthrough status, which means yeah, it's a breakthrough medicine. therapy, mm-hmm. which so it's a breakthrough medicine. And what that means is they give approval to fast track the different stages of clinical trials that need to occur so we can start helping people as soon as possible. And that is Australia. Only to medicines yeah. that are, that could be vastly superior to existing treatments. It's a very yes. rare destination. Yes, it is. Yeah, Australia, and where are we in Australia? <laughs> so, yeah, so we have the SASB approvals taking place, trickling through, but yeah. Yeah. we need to get through some of the state barriers, which we're working on. But also in Australia, we've put in submissions for the rescheduling of both MDMA and psilocybin from Schedule 9, which is prohibited mm-hmm. medicine, which implies it's dangerous and of no benefit, which is completely wrong. 
and is mm. simply based on the politicization of President Nixon in 1970. Yeah. Um, to Schedule 8, Schedule 8 meaning controlled medicine. So that means the medicine would be used in clinical environments under the supervision of trained practitioners. And that's where this medicine should be sitting, if not Schedule 4. So in Australia, we have a number of medicines in Schedule 8 and Schedule 4, which are far more dangerous than either psilocybin or MDMA. And What's yeah, Schedule 4? Schedule 4 is a, a more slightly more accessible, still controlled, but slightly more accessible. But we have mm. medicines like Ibogaine, which is used to treat very heavy drug addicts. Uh, it's a psychedelic medicine also, but it's far, mm. far more strong mm. and, you know, has, you know, potential far more significant effects on the heart and so on, whereas psilocybin and MDMA do not. Mm. Um, as I said before, there's been no adverse events with their use whatsoever mm. and um, you know they continually come up in trials like for example there's a recent trial that has been undertaken in Imperial College directly comparing an SSRI and antidepressant with psilocybin assisted therapy and in that trial yeah um, the 60 patients um, were either given two doses of psilocybin with psychotherapy or a daily dose of escitalopram, which is a, an antidepressant. And at the end of the trial, twice as many, so the, twice as many of the patients in the psilocybin group went into remission as the escitalopram group. They mm. also had far less side effects and less suicidal ideation. Yeah. So mm. what we're seeing is that in every single trial, these treatments are showing themselves as to be far more effective and actually safer than existing mm. treatments because... And again, they don't treat the symptoms, they treat the core. It's a long-term resolution, not a suppression. Correct, correct. And this is all about curative medicines, not just palliative medicines. It's yeah. about, you know, finding a cure so that a person can then, you know, become fully aware of what has been their trauma or their challenge and they can get through it themselves. To mm. some extent, obviously, with competent therapists is extremely important. It is. But it is important to note, you know, that a lot of the existing treatments do have negative effects for a lot of people. They mm. can lead to suicidality in some patients, and their side effects are significant, as as many of us will know. And also, it's it's a known fact that it's extremely difficult to withdraw from antidepressants if you've been on them for for a while, and that can create its own problems. So. We need to be very careful. And Mind Medicine Australia says, you know, we see success as expanding the treatment options available to medical practitioners and their patients, ensuring that these treatments become a first line option so that if you go to your medical practitioner, they will discuss a range of treatments with you, disclosing full risks and benefits. One thing we hear about often is that doctors don't fully disclose the, the side effects of antidepressants to their patients, mm -hmm. and that should be happening. You know, we should have full disclosure to all patients, and then it becomes a decision for the doctor and patient yeah. as to what's going to be the most effective and safe treatment for that patient on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not just this broad brushstroke that everyone who comes in, you know, who's feeling a little bit sad just gets given an antidepressant script. Mm -hmm. And, you know, success for us will look that look like first-line treatments. Secondly, that the remission rates are very high and continue to be very high and that the right treatment protocols are put in place for all patients. And finally, that these treatments are accessible and available to all Australians, no matter where they're based, their financial circumstances. So a big part of our focus is setting up the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. Mm, which I saw. January. Yeah. Um, and we've had our first cohort go through 46 psychiatrists, psychologists, GPs, physicians, mm. therapists, mm. mental health nurses, uh, social workers, occupational therapists mm. and counsellors. And so they've already gone through and many of them have rated the course as the most life-changing and important course and the most brilliant tra mm. training they've ever undertaken we have a world-class faculty and our second intake commences in a couple of weeks and is nearly full and then we have in probably up to four intakes in 2022 the demand is huge
And so this is preparation for what's coming because you anticipate the laws are going to need to start keeping up with all the other research around the world. The research now is reasonably irrefutable. It's the trials have been complete. The stats are in. We can't argue with these ridiculously successful numbers. Absolutely. But also a lot of these therapists are able to, to start working with patients now. So they can do, Oh, okay. you know, they can help prepare patients who are going underground because it's not illegal to do that. They yeah. can provide integration to patients who've used the medicines. They mm. can work on trials and they can work with their patients who are getting SASB special access scheme approvals. So in mm. actual fact, Great. Um, therapists who are being trained and getting the qualification now are the mm. front runners in this space. And they're the mm. therapists who will gain first access also to be part of you know, some Fantastic. of the exactly. trials and, and other yeah. um, pathways that become available. And St. Vincent's has started its own trial, I think, last year. Is that right? They've done, they yeah. have some yeah, funding so, for a trial? Yeah. So we part funded a trial at St. Vincent's, which is for end of life um, anxiety and stress caused by a terminal diagnosis. Yeah. And that's um, going through uh, about 30 patients. It's similar to some trials that have been conducted overseas at New York University and St. Johns Hopkins. And the interesting thing is that the one at New York University, which I mentioned before, which was an inspiration for me in terms of actually trying this Mm. myself, was what was really interesting about that trial was that 80% of the patients went into remission um, immediately from their end-of-life stress and anxiety and were able to... You know, continue. But what is remarkable is that after four and a half years, the researchers went back to those patients, and not only were the majority of them still alive, but all of them were still in remission who were still alive. Wow. You know, that's pretty significant. That's a whole other study. That's a whole different study that's got to be done. Mm -hmm. That's staggering. I didn't know that. That's really, my mind is blown. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. We probably should have done this sooner. Would you mind touching base for audience members the difference between MDMA, whose Mm -hmm. full name I cannot pronounce, no matter how much I researched, (laughs) and (laughs) let's just talk about psilocybin, which is an element of magic mushrooms. Can you just share the difference basically between the two? Yeah. So MDMA is known as an empathogen. So basically what it does is it's actually not a traditional psychedelic. So no. Um, what it does is when you have the MDMA, you feel very warm and loving and connected. And unfortunately, MDMA has been very vilified because it's been used a lot as a party drug, uh, people at music festivals and so on. But often what young people are getting when they think they're getting MDMA is an adulterated substance. Yeah. In fact, in a lot of the capsules that people think is MDMA, there's other substances and sometimes there's no MDMA whatsoever which is what leads to those headlines, further drug deaths from MDMA, Mm. which is unfortunately not what's actually happening. And it's also known for the audience, if they haven't heard of MDMA, ecstasy or molly. That's the street kind of name for it, yeah. So unfortunately, ecstasy and molly have got a bad name because they're taking it at music festivals, at rave parties and so on, in combination with other substances, often with dehydration, Mm. with kids staying up all night. And that can lead to really bad effects. Uh, But MDMA in its pure GMP, pharmaceutical grade substance that's used as a medicine in a medically controlled environment, creates enormous empathy and trust and safety for the patient where they're able to talk about their trauma with the therapist in a very safe and loving environment. And what the MDMA does is it reduces the activity of the amygdala, which often triggers a fight or flight response. So when a therapist normally gets you to talk about your trauma, that can re-trigger or re-traumatize you, which can make you worse. Yes. In effect, you know, I'm sure we've all spoken to people who've suffered with trauma at one time or another where we try to talk about the trauma and they either burst into floods of tears, race out of the room, um, can become very emotional and it can become very problematic. But what happens with this is the patient's able to talk about their trauma, they're able to accept what has happened and to move forwards with their lives and be healed. And, you know, in the case of the phase two trials with um, MAPS, 
there were 105 patients, all of whom had been suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder for an average of 18 years. Just three medicinal treatments um, with a short course of psychotherapy. 52% of them went into remission immediately, but 67% after 12 months with full integration. Yeah. So you can imagine the suffering that they'd experienced, then the remission that they achieved, and that's yeah. versus 5% from existing treatments. Yes. How can we not give that gift to people? You know, it's, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So MDMA provides an incredible therapeutic window in which competent mm -hmm. therapists can work with a patient to heal. Now, in the case I'll just mention to the audience for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Yeah, a wonderful <laughs> organisation. Yes. And then um, psilocybin is the psychoactive component of magic mushrooms. Uh, it is a traditional psychedelic medicine that has been with humanity since the beginning of human civilization. Mm. And what it does in the brain is um, it's, it helps to bypass what's called the default mode network of our brain. The default mode network of our brain keeps us stuck in very rigid, uh, stuck thought loops, particularly if we're suffering from depression or anxiety or some form of trauma. You know, I'm not good enough. Things mm. won't work out for me. My life is rubbish. Uh, no one loves me. And actually, Sharon, I will provide um, a video that you might like to attach with this uh, sure. interview that people can watch that gives some further further guidance. But the wonderful Thank thing you. about psilocybin is that it... Um, it really connects beautifully to what's known as our 5-TH2A receptor, which is um, a serotonin receptor in our brain. And the psilocybin slots beautifully into that receptor and it creates this therapeutic window so that in effect what happens is when you take the psilocybin, the default mode network of your brain is sort of goes to sleep and mm. um, you get this sense of incredible neural connectivity. And I'll provide you with some scans of fMRI. Um, yeah, good idea. Done on some patients with depression that show in the placebo. So for a patient with depression, they have very limited neural connectivity, you know, these rigid stuck thought loops. But mm. with the ingestion of the psilocybin, they experience this massive neurogenesis, this neural connectivity where different hemispheres of their brain start reconnecting, they experience increased neural plasticity. And that allows this connectivity, this sense of oneness to take place and again creates a therapeutic window where a competent therapist can work with that patient post the treatment because the patient in the psilocybin experience is in an entirely altered state. They will mm. usually experience some form of ego dissolution. Yes. And it'll no longer be Tanya or Sharon. It'll be mm. one with everything. Yes. Feel part of everything. Everything feels part of you. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And from that experience, you can then start to come to terms with some of the things that are holding you back. Yeah. So in my case, what that looked like was um, I travel completely out of my body. I actually saw these three boxes that had the word ego in them with a red cross through them. And I kept saying, ego, please get out of my way, get out of my way, go down the drain. And actually below the three boxes were wow. these drains, these sewage, look like sewage pipes or drains. And I kept trying to push my ego down the drain. That was what symbolism was of what I was seeing. Yeah. Once I had pushed my ego down the drain, I was then able to journey further with my experience where I just became one with everything and everything became a part of me. Mm. And if you have the right dosage of the medicine, which you will always have in a medically controlled environment, then you will hopefully inevitably experience that. Now, with some people that may take time, you know, if a person mm. has been on antidepressants for a number of years or decades. Yes, it may take more experiences um, with the psilocybin for, to get a breakthrough like that. Mm. Um, so it's arguable that some patients are going to need more than two or three medicinal doses of these medicines. Yeah. And, and only time will tell, you know, as we do more research and, mm. and you know, 
work out more of the, the protocols for treatment, I think it will become obvious what different patients are going to need in terms of dose, mm. in terms of support, in terms of how many mm. doses and so on. One of the ways Sam Harris describes it is uh, he strived for years to have that experience through meditation and taking, yeah. it was MDMA, helped him experience what the whole experience could be with meditation, which he now says he experiences through meditation. So it's almost like you get to the end point. Oh, yeah. so that's what it feels like to be fully the one. And yeah. then now he meditates to that, to knowing that reality. He actually did his first psilocybin experience, I think at the end of last year. You should go and have a look at it and you might want to share it with you. I listeners. did. I did watch that. I thought it was fascinating. He did MDMA years ago and psilocybin last year. And his friend instructed him. I won't actually talk about the instructions. Go and watch the, um, or listen to the audio because he has a great disclaimer and I think that's important. The other thing I think that's worth touching on is if we keep holding on to 1970s attitudes around this and bring 1970s attitudes to it, my, I want caution and I want clinical studies. And I know you support, let's do it in a very methodological way. That's exactly how to do it. But any moral panic around this to me is looking really fuddy duddish at this point. Absolutely. Especially, well, for two reasons. One of them is that, firstly, these medicines, and particularly the mushrooms and some of the other psychedelic plant medicines, are readily available. And so, you know, for people to suggest that, you know, um, we should somehow withhold this from people is actually very short-sighted because what will happen is, <clears throat> and what is happening now is that the longer that these medicines take to be above mm. ground and in medically controlled environments, the more people will go to the underground and take risks to get better because people will do anything to, you know, like we only get one life, one short life. Yeah. And these medicines really reiterate that. Well, in this incarnation anyway, you know, yes. so, you know, so the fact of the matter is if people are really sick and they've been suffering for years and decades, they're going to do, and as as there's more media articles about these treatments, they'll just go and find the treatments. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many underground practitioners who are outstanding and hopefully they'll find them. But there's, mm -hmm. as inevitably happens in any sector that is taking off, um, there'll also be cowboys that come in and who will put up their shingles and who will, put themselves out there as psychedelic assisted therapists who don't have the experience either with dosing or holding the space or integrating patients properly. And then there could be adverse events that do occur. So yeah. we need to accelerate access to these treatments as fast as we can. Mm. Um, it's just imperative that, um, you know, we do that now. And of course, you know, there's plenty of space to continue research in this space at the same time the two are not mutually exclusive we can mm. provide access and start treating all these veterans and first responders and others our brothers our sisters our mothers our fathers our employees who are also yeah. many of whom are suffering um, mm. especially in this you know coming out of post-covid world where we're seeing the terrible harms that have been done especially to children yeah. and young people and older mm. people as well who've been isolated and we need to provide solutions the elephant in the room is the lack of treatment innovation for over five decades. Yes. That is what we need to be talking about, not about more telehealth, not about training more psychiatrists and more psychologists. Or more antidepressants. Patients. It can't it be just more and more antidepressants when their success rate is so low and placebos often perform nearly as well, if not as well, yeah. when well, there is an answer working, here. Then why would our mental health crisis be getting so yeah. much? You know, yes. It's yeah. clear. Mm. Uh, so yeah so we need to get away from these attitudes of 50 years ago you know where it's it's mm. 2021 well there hasn't really been a breakthrough in mental health since 1980s and 90s when antidepressants hit the market really full force right. so if we haven't had a transformation in that entire sector yet mental health is getting worse and worse and worse surely if we have a potential pathway and again, it's not a panacea. We're not saying it is for no. everyone. It's not suited to everyone. It needs to be done under controlled conditions with a very well-trained expert guide. With all those caveats, it becomes a point. I think it's just a political football. And Correct. And, you know, and, and it's great to see the Australian government actually uh, 
you know, supporting trials. And in fact, yes. the, you know, the $15 million yeah. that the Australian government has announced for yes. research is actually larger than any other government in the world has actually announced. That's fantastic. So, you know, it's We're out of the fuddy-duddy category. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you look at it now, Sharon, Australia actually has got the potential to lead in this space. Yeah. We could be one we of do. the global leaders in this space. We've got fantastic yeah. scientists. We have amazing researchers, amazing medical you know, doctors who really care about their patients and want to get them well. And I should mm. also say that there's a massive market opportunity for Australia. You know, the market is valued like it's it's like some estimates are as high as $200 billion marketplace for mm. psychedelic medicines over the next few years. And we're seeing startups setting up every, you know, almost every two weeks since Peter and I started Mind Medicine mm-hmm. Australia. So there's isn't one of the challenges, though, that you can't patent the MDMA structure or the psilocybin structure. So startups are coming in. So big pharma isn't necessarily yeah. going to be funding it, which is why there's so many individuals who are funding it right now to make a difference well, in the world. They're literally doing it as a charitable donation. Yeah, well, we certainly do that. But there's also startups, commercial startups, for-profit startups around the world, probably more than 50 now who are listed on mm-hmm. various stock exchanges, who are investing in reinventing the molecules, manufacturing yeah. new medicines, rollout of clinics mm-hmm. and so on. So there will be for-profit models where people will make a lot of yeah. money. But we say it's really important to do that in an ethical way. Um, mm. and, and we hope that the for-profit and not-for-profit sectors can work effectively together to make sure that these medicines don't get priced out of, you yeah. know, out of the market i mean so that you know anyone can get access to them not just wealthy yeah. people because that would be a travesty thank you so much tanya i really appreciate it. i find this conversation truly fascinating um i do follow what you do i have attended the videos that you've been sharing the uh the study out of israel i watched that and i was really interested in it congratulations and the other thing that i was thinking is um i might be able to send you some of my i've got some beautiful songs and recordings on my recent albums some of which have been informed by you know my experiences with the medicines and some of the insights that i've received and um so I'd love to share them with you anyway as a gift. And That'd be great. Thank you. That's really kind yeah. of you. Send through the links because yeah. I think that to be informed is to stop moral panic. To be informed yeah. is to understand how we can support people who are suffering unnecessarily. So anything that we can do to access the information that's going to decode our brains from 1970s thinking to where the current research is, which has a lot of credibility, a lot of g- legitimacy in the yeah. world, is the political groundswell is going to shift. The attitude towards it is going to shift until oh, I believe totally in our shifting. lifetime it is shifting. Oh, no, no. I mean, this is inevitable. Like within the next yes, it is. three yeah. years, yes. uh, these medicines will become much more readily available. Um, yeah. Not only, I think, will they be available in the medical environments, but over time they'll become available to those who are seeking personal development, creative development, and so yes. on. And it's- Tanya, it was lovely connecting with you. I really appreciate your time. Where can people find out more about what you do and the movement if they just want to start paying attention to this as what's coming in the future? Absolutely. So, you know, we'd love you to look at our website, mindmedicineaustralia.org. We are a registered charity. So please, if you can, donate small and large donations or make a huge difference in the mission to make these medicines available and to heal all the, the suffering that's occurring. Um, yeah. So please support us. Um, look at our learn section on our website. Join our chapters. We have 30 chapters mm. around Australia and New Zealand. Um, attend our events. We have lots of free webinars. We have a global summit in November. Um, register if you're a therapist. Register for the certificate in psychedelic mm. assisted therapies. Um, just get involved and reach out. We also have volunteering opportunities. And we also do advertise, you know, we're expanding our, our team. So we have some wonderful jobs coming up. Mm. So people should Fantastic. Keep it on as well. Congratulations on how far it's our, come. Say we're looking for a general manager at the moment. So. Wow. Okay. Good plug. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's fantastic. All right. Well, I recommend it. I, I follow you and your work. And I've, as I said, attended a couple of your classes. I think it's fascinating work and it's 
unbelievably important and significant. So thank you so much for your time, Tanya. I really appreciate you. No, thank you, Sharon. Fascinating talking with you and um, thank looking you. forward to meeting you in person soon. That'd be great. Thanks so much. Thank you.